Okay, thanks a lot for having me do this. Uh, I'll, the first part of this is, is kind of boilerplate stuff. So if you have any questions, I mean, that, that's fine. But uh, I'll, I'll sort of alert you when I'm adding sort of the newer and more controversial stuff uh, toward the, the top. I want to start by giving sort of a, an introduction of, uh, of how we bring ecological and economics into, especially environmental economics courses, but also courses in the public policy um, that I taught. Um, so the site I think ecological economics brings is that the human economy is embedded within the biophysical world and his social institutions. So um, a teacher was Nicholas Czerczewski Roche, and he was a very, uh, you know, very smart mind and very analytical. And uh, so the definition of economics is science of the allocation of scarce resources among alternative ends. Okay, situations, a lot of problems that that, uh, you know, there's nothing, uh, nothing wrong with that. The model essentially uh, of an individual making investment decisions, making consumption decisions at a point in time. But that really uh, started with Sergescu and, and especially Herman Daly's critique of the depiction of, a, of an economy as a circular flow with no resources going in and no waste coming out. So this is shown in the, the, the left hand uh, panel there. Uh, and again, so it's a circular flow between uh, consumers and producers, a theory of allocation with some very strict, uh, strict mathematical properties in the basic model. So what ecological uh, economics did from the start was sort of uh, spread the boundaries to, to have it include uh, the right-hand side, too, the natural environment represented by the tree and human society and uh, humans as uh, social uh, creatures. Yeah. Uh, Again, coming from Georgescu and, uh, and Herman Daly, uh, instead of a circular flow, you get uh, more linear system. Georgescu's uh, first book, uh, published in 1971, The Interlaw and the Economic Process. And in uh, the 70s, this is when, uh, again, uh, ecological economics really started with Georgescu's work, uh, Kenneth Boulding, The Economics of the Coming Spaceship, and, Earth. and as Herman's. Uh, Books on steady state economics. So uh, the, the point that that sort of framework makes clear is that uh, resources are finite. The economy depends on the flow of resources from the natural world, and uh, it ends up uh, back in the Earth system as a resource sink. So going in pollution and, uh, coming out is really a one-way flow. Okay, so in, including um, what I do, with, especially with environmental economics, uh, I try to start with a long-term perspective on the place of humans in the natural world. Uh, for that of human history, we lived as hunter-gatherers in small communities that were egalitarian and, and sustainable. So to make the point, I show some uh, videos on hunter-gatherers. Uh, the point is the market is a, a very recent uh, human invention, human institution. And there's an important paper by uh, Joseph Henrich and some others uh, called uh, the, the term societies in the title, meaning Western, uh, educated, industrial, rich, and democratic. Uh, you know, it turns out to be very, very peculiar uh, properties of, of human society. So the bottom line, I think, of, uh, of both those things is that uh, we need to be skeptical about claims of human nature uh, on both sides, really. I mean, humans are not naturally rapace and greedy and so on. And they're not naturally loving and kind and altruistic either. Uh, and these different characteristics are emphasized or de-emphasized depending on particular society. So I think I can bring to teaching is uh, the importance of a neoclassical equilibrium theory, and no matter what I'm teaching, whether it's a policy course, environmental economics, or uh, health economics, or whatever, I spend a lot of time on uh, the intellectual history of welfare economics and how it was a unified system of thought, how pieces fit together, consumption theory, uh, production theory, how these come together, uh, talk about it fits in all the 
dual uh, standard economics uh, come out of that. Marginal analysis, discounting, future, rate of and so forth. What uh, really distant effect the data that's come out in the, in the past few years is, uh, is really astonishing, both in terms of climate change uh, and the loss of the non human nature. Here's a uh, I try to work in almost every lecture I give. It shows uh, the temperature and CO2 record over the last half million years or so. And so it's kind of an old slide. Uh, some new papers have taken this back to about a million years. Uh, so there's two things in that slide. <coughs> Blue is temperature, green CO2. First, it's a tight relationship between atmospheric CO2 and temperature. Another way it jumps out is that uh, the far uh, left-hand uh, part of that blue squiggle, you see the last 10,000 years have been really incredibly stable. This is the whole scene. Uh, and this really made agriculture possible, uh, civilization, and so on. So everything really changed with this warming climate. The climate, there have been periods, as you can see, the climate was as warm, but these were really spikes. And the whole time you had this uh, literally of years history of a stable climate and a warm climate. Another out is the spike in, in CO2 uh, in recent years. Um, and this is an important point to make too. Usually, almost always, when people talk about the increased CO2, they talk the increase uh, over pre-industrial levels. That is, in the uh, 1800 or a real important point to make is most of that has been really recent. Most of that green spike at the end has, been, has happened within my lifetime, since 1950 or so. Um, 19 to the end of World War II, uh, CO2 levels were probably around 300. And then more astonishingly, probably about half that increase has come within the time of, um, of the students who are uh, listening to this lecture. So, so it's very recent. It, you know, it's really radical change. Look at, uh, uh, again, the stability of the, uh, the CO2 emissions, for, again, for the last million years, it's been between 200 and 280. Uh, and kick us out of really warm periods and ice ages. So all you need to climate change is that, that green spike. But we really don't know what, what the consequences are going to be, but they're, uh, they're bound to disrupt. Thing is sort of the, the effect of um, human activity on biome. Uh, whole scene, and again, especially the last uh, few decades. So this is from uh, uh, some um, work by Backlog Smeal. So it shows uh, the, the percentage of the of mass of humans uh, 10,000 years ago. And it, it really doesn't show up there. You can, if you use the fine glass, there's a thin red line right at the part of that, uh, top of that purple uh, triangle. Square really a minor player. Uh, the pop human population uh, never exceeded uh, just a few million, probably one to four million for most of the, the life to uh, 1900, uh, and again, we're talking mostly organic agriculture there. This is where fossil fuels really kicked in. Uh, by 1900, humans and their farm animals, which is blue, uh, really eliminated uh, the biomass on Earth. This one shows uh, the current situation in uh, 2015. And one thing, total biomass has increased by about six-fold. Uh, but the, the dumping in of fossil fuels to grow crops and raise farm animals, uh, just this, this tremendous impact on, on the Earth's biosphere just in the next few decades. Uh, and uh, so a new information coming out is to, just to sort of the decimation. It's not really biodiversity so much. It's just a wiping out of other animals. This total uh, number of mammals has declined by about half since 1970. The same with insects, fish in the ocean, birds, and so on. So it's not happening uh, just in the last few de decades. And the accelerating. 
Okay, I want to shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about uh, behavioral economics. Uh, this was an area I was really uh, into a few years ago. And uh, it's a field that's uh, really almost taken economics by storm. And it's changed the way a lot of people sort of think about the economy and the uh, real economic policy and so on. Uh, a, a lot of game theory. <clears throat> and uh, one thing that really changed things was an article by Werner Goose in 1982, uh, he developed something called the ultimatum game. So I want to know uh, that, uh, the role of nudging and changing economic behavior, and then sort of beyond that, talk, talk about the limits uh, of, um, of behavior in terms of policy. And this leads to the, the final thing I want to talk about, is the role of government and this sort of government versus the market myth. Uh, again, feel free to ask questions here. Uh, the item game, it's pretty simple. Suppose one gives you $100 and asks you to share it with some unknown person. You can not share you as little as you like, but the person you give the share to can reject the offer. In that case, either of you get anything. So the person knows, I mean, if it's between the two of us, there, uh, that someone gives me $100 and asks me to share it with you. I can give you a letter, I can give you $50, I can give you $10. If you don't offer, you reject it, neither one of us uh, gives anything. The standard model, <coughs> the model of economic man, you know, he is a man, you know, so, we, we, and so on. Uh, economic man uh, would offer the minimum, and any positive uh, offer would be accepted, more is to less, and so on. So keep $99, give you a dollar. You're happy because you have a dollar you hadn't had before. Uh, with, similar with the market economies, the typical offer is around 50, uh, 40%. Anything less than 30% uh, is usually rejected. Uh, it's been consistently found in hundreds of studies and a variety of settings and cultures and sort of, uh, you know, any variations on this model. So one of the uh, sort of the drivers of the standard economic model is what's called self-regarding preferences. So this undermines uh, again uh, the consumer part of uh, neoclassical theory, which I mentioned before in terms of weird societies. Uh, he's an anthropologist who or actually started out as an economist, undergraduate degrees in economics, and he went on to get a PhD in anthropology. And he got a MacArthur Foundation grant with some economists, including uh, Sam Bowles and Herb Gintis and some others. And they came in 15 different cultures. Uh, it's a very interesting paper with interesting results. Um, the bottom line was the, this is for the canonical model of self-interested behavior is not supported in any society study. Now, they're varied a lot. I mean, some, some cultures gave very high offers, and these offers were rejected. Other cultures gave low offers and they, they were accepted. But you really uh, had to understand how the, the, the different economies in these cultures work to make predictions. Yeah, there's not Kevin McCabe who's in this evolutionary group I'm involved in. But this is kind of a, <coughs> one of the variations. <coughs> he played game and game in two groups. And in one group, he just had a diagram that looked like this. This is three dots that looks like a face. And even subjects who had this diagram near them made significantly higher offers. I mean, you again, consciously, whatever you felt like you were being watched and judged, this made you make, make higher offers. Anyway, you know, stuff that's made them gain. But this kind of, uh, of insight is really important in, uh, in, in very policies like, like climate change. And, you know, we all know this, really. You know, in fact, may not be as important as the belief system in your peer group. You know, you're a white male in the South. Uh, your peers are not likely to believe in climate change. So what are the costs to you of expressing your concern, concern about global warming? You lose respect of your peer group to some extent. What are the benefits of, you know, sitting outside your group? You know, probably really none. I mean, one person uh, doesn't make that much difference. So, uh, um, People use uh, social context in terms of environmental policy and eventually uh, impressive uh, results. 
This um, is of a <coughs> solar panels in California, and uh, some of uh, there's a subdivision there that one of the all the houses had solar panels. This was one of the, the selling points. People got to design their houses before they were built, and they, they talked about the location of the panels. The second thing that came out is that a number of the, uh, the homeowners wanted the solar panels on the front of the house, even though in many cases it was better to have them at the rear in terms of the amount of sun they captured and uh, southern exposure and all that. But they wanted where their neighbors could see them if they had solar panels or environmentalists and all that. Yeah, here's favorite examples. Uh, a few years ago, Texas had a, a real problem with littering. Uh, and the, a really good consultant group come in, and uh, they studied the problem. They found out who was doing the, the littering and sort of how to focus on that peer group. And uh, it turned out that a lot of the littering <coughs> was done by, you know, say, sort of red and white males driving around in their pickup trucks and throwing beer bottles out the window. A lot of my relatives in Texas would fall into that group. So I'm not being kind of... So then this, uh, you know, this slogan, don't mess with Texas, is sort of macho thing, go men, don't pollute, and all that. And it really worked. And once they flipped that, that group, uh, then uh, the, the littering problem in Texas is uh, uh, really small, but it, it's, uh, it's amazing that the change. So that's it. But there are limitations, and uh, I'll just talk about a, a few of these. Um, there's a lot of work done by behavioral economist on obesity. And this is a quote from a newspaper article. Taylor won a Nobel Prize a few years ago by his behavioral economics and, and what nudging. Um, and his, okay, this is from a newspaper article. Taylor is important for understanding obesity precisely because he brought the discipline of economics to understanding why people make seemingly irrational choices. So, uh, so seen as a failure of self-control. But Thaler's work um, really points out that self-control really is unusual. Most people make daily life is based on what, what's easiest and what's uh, immediately pleasing. Uh, on obesity talks about sort of the evolutionary aspects. Again, we as hunter-gatherers, we have a craving for fat and salt because it was hard to come by in a, a scared environment. There's nothing uh, wrong with that, but it, this is, I think, um, chart showing the, uh, the, the, the epidemic is really uh, pretty recent. So, uh, again, in the first uh, diagram there's uh, two age groups in 1974. So, it's up obesity percentage has gone up from about 5% to 20% uh, uh, just in that, whatever it is, 34-year period. What happened? I mean, were people more rational in the 1970s or 1980s? I mean, I don't know. So there must be some other factors, some factors uh, that exist. And, uh, you know, to the, uh, the sugar industry, subsidies to the sugar industry that's been mentioned uh, is a cause. Uh, so a lot of sugar, um, the expansion of fast food restaurants, uh, and, and so on. And food and fast food restaurants to, to make this craving that people want to eat. So any, whatever reasons, there's some institutional factors, some government policy uh, factors that work there that need to be uh, added to some of the end goal behavioral explanations. Along the same lines as addiction, uh, again, of applied economic reasoning at the individual uh, level. Gary Becker has talked about rational addiction uh, and so on. Uh, but I tend to focus on, on it. But in the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, and thousands institutional factors going on. This is uh, another uh, newspaper article. <coughs> and this is an article about the final 
report of the President Trump's Commission on, on Combating Drug Abuse. You know, true, but they really uh, drug industry for um, delivery, so aggressive marketing and industry sponsored uh, and conferences aimed at expanding opioid use. They minimize the dangers of, of addiction. Uh, they would encourage uh, doctors to prescribe these opiates. Uh, the prescription drugs is you know, mushroom in the, in the past few days because of this. Uh, and I guess what it's just sort of the response to this response of this commission that was to actually uh, give the drug industry more money to, to develop uh, what they call use to turn opiates. Uh, there's, there's addictive as the original opiates, but not as damaging. So, It's not a matter of individual behavior. You have to overlay something over this in terms of the institutional factors that uh, surround uh, this phenomenon. Okay, and um, has to do with sustainability. And I put quotes in here because some of the some of the quotes are from pretty prominent ecological economists. But in literature, unsustainable behavior is blamed on uh, individuals or human nature. Humans are really greedy. And selfish. Uh, they've always uh, ravaged the planet, you know, after gas sort of marched across the planet and caused uh, an overkill, which I happened based on some recent recent studies of uh, climate change and extinction of large mammal species. But anyway, the, you know, the real problem is the economic system we've sort of uh, accidentally evolved into. Surplus production generates a superstructure of support. You know, political, religious, ideological, and so on, all are locked into this uh, system. This is uh, uh, an study that uh, I've been working with a colleague, Lisi Crow, for several years now. And, uh, again, uh, both of us are sort of starting to see the human economy as one unified system. And this thing makes it interesting uh, to look at from a political point of view and so on. I mean, uh, you may have to pause for a second. People are saying their audio is up. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yes, I hear it. Okay. And two people message me they don't have audio. Um, um, All right. Sorry, Sorry, I'll message everyone. I'm in sort of an aside. But, you know, a lot of us are sort of you know, scratching our heads at trying to, uh, oops. Uh, you know, scratching our heads to why do the, you know, the poorest people, uh, why are the most uh, ardent Trumps? And really look at it. And first of all, bottom, uh, at the bottom, at the percent, the bottom's dropped down to the economy. I mean, the past few decades, you know, preschool education or lesser incomes have fallen by about 30% real terms uh, since 1970, and they have the most to lose if they if their income drops. Um, the top really don't. I mean, think of Bill Gates. What if he loses I don't know, ten billion dollars? I mean, so what? He's not going to start buying used cars or stop going out to dinner. I mean, it really doesn't affect him. But if you're making you know, 34000 a year, and your income starts falling, uh, you're in some trouble. So, uh, anyways, the whole thing, it, uh, it makes Okay, uh, the role of government. <clears throat> uh, I learned a lot from uh, another person's evolution uh, group, Manu Mazzucato. Uh, she's an economist. I think she's still at Bristol University in the UK. But, um, one thing I asked in the lectures I gave is sort of break down this myth of the dichotomy between the government and the free market. And this sort of pervades economic theory. And uh, in environmental economics, of course, you know, you're always ended with free market solutions versus hand and control solutions. You know, you want to be free or you want to be commanded and controlled. The whole life's sort of uh, loaded. But anyway, the side of the economy government really is one unified system. In all development countries, uh, government spending accounts for between
between 4 and 50% of gross domestic product. The sort of who gets the money in which sectors of the economy are supported, which are not. If healthcare spending, for example, the U.S. spends more, I mean, directly, the government spends directly more per capita on healthcare than uh, any country, uh, any other country in the world, yet we have the worst results. It's a matter of where the money goes, where the subsidy goes, and so on. It's education and law. Okay, here government spending is a percent of GDP, and this is about 42%. These numbers vary according to, to uh, the source they're calculating. The spending at all levels of government, from federal, state, and local. But it's not where use is really not an outlier. It's actually about the same as Norway, 44%. It's in countries like Australia, uh, about the same as Canada. Uh, France is an outlier at the other end, very, very high percentage. Uh, in the same ballpark as the U.S. Um, so you know, it was really surprising when I, when I saw this chart. The linked economies, the government spending is actually uh, very low, 20%, 16%. So when you, you know the government, the, the rhetoric now involving healthcare. So again, let the market go. It's you know, it's really, really bogus. This whole discussion. The government supports the healthcare sector. It's about 23 percent of the federal budget, as much as national defense. Again, depending on how you calculate it. Uh, since how that um, divided among the players in the healthcare sector. This year, this last thing, most of the new drugs uh, had by drug companies uh, were developed in government labs or government funded labs. This is what's called public research institutes. Again, every new drug was developed in government labs using taxpayer money. Uh, this is a basic study published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago. But the private sector uh, gets Research applies for patents for drugs, and if it's uh, you know, the surplus value of the markets. Uh, this, uh, for those of you that are interested, this YouTube by Mariana Mazzucato is really good. She's very dynamic, very forceful, excellent speaker. And she made, they just written a book called The Entrepreneurial State. But she point uh, the real innovation engine in the global economy is not the entrepreneurial class, like the capitalist trails through the thicket of government red tape and taxation. No, the real engine of innovation is, uh, is government and government spending. <coughs> and uh, she developed a program about uh, the iPhone. She had a number of products, but this shows the first generation iPod and then the iPod Touch and phone. And components of that, every important component and component was developed in government uh, lab or uh, department or so on. Uh, DOE, uh, DARPA, uh, U.S. military, and so on. All these technologies really uh, came from, uh, from government spending. Another uh, really interesting example uh, she uses is uh, uh, in the, the package that Obama put forth uh, after the crash in 2008. Uh, the government gave these loan, really massive loans uh, to a company called Solyndra. Which manufactured panels, and it was half a billion dollars, an amazing amount of money. And the company ended up going bankrupt and become a poster child for conservatives' view that the government can't pick winners and losers. You know, this is what happened. They made loans to two companies. The other one was Tesla, again, one of the most successful, at least at this point, uh, in the economy. Uh, they gave a startup loan that really funded. A lot of the research and so on. Um, and it had the chance, to, uh, it had an option on shares of Tesla. It involved shares, you know, I think millions of shares, $2 a share. You know, the, the share price went up, I don't know, $100, something like that. But it didn't exercise that option. So, anyway, uh, Mariana makes is that uh, you can look at these government initiatives. The government does things that the private sector can't do. Going to take us going to mass uh, large amounts of capital that the private sector can do. And it should, it should take the benefits 
of the assessments, you know, not only the uh, not only the uh, the dance line. Yeah, I had a quote. Yeah, this quote from uh, John McCain: "The important role for for government is not to do things which individuals are doing already, and to do them a little better or a little worse, but to do those things which is not done at all." And like the, the country really successful countries like China, uh, one where commerce is booming is because the government can mobilize massive amounts of capital and apply them uh, in specific very large investment projects that the private sector can't do. Okay, so we can take a little bit further. Um, <clears throat> most environmental policy now concentrates on getting the prices right, including at large economics. Price right, let the market take care of it. <coughs> Monitoring economic services and payment uh, ecosystems and so on. So uh, this is work I've done with Hannes Lang, Who's a former student now at a technical university in, in Munich? But uh, we, that we should concede to be public goods rather than uh, positive externalities to be subsidized. A lot of this is based on the work of Daniel Bromley, editor of the uh, of Lyme. He argued the question is what to protect, not how much to protect uh, at the margin. And again, uh, think about climate change and loss. The natural world. Uh, once these things are getting really desperate, and we need grand solutions. So we applied this in a study of the Sud wetland in South Sudan. Um, it's probably the largest uh, wetland in the world. It's big, bigger than the Anatolian in, in, in Paraguay. It's kind of the largest migration of large animals in the world. There's a, a kind of a called a cob, white-eared cob. And uh, probably the migration uh, is about a million and a half of these animals across uh, and from the wet season to the dry season. So the home to about a million tribal people who depend on the marsh for their, uh, their livelihoods. Again, this was done by a uh, unit. And uh, uh, it's just a uh, uh, supposed beautiful area. Thomas and I are supposed to do a flyover in 2016. But uh, you know, we do, but we couldn't do the trip because of the, uh, the there. <coughs> but it's a sort of ever-changing, uh, meandering of, uh, of plant rotation and streams changing course and so on. Now, this is during the wet season of some of the, uh, the people like to think of the Noor, the Myrtle, the Shillock, um, uh, and the and the cattle go to, to higher ground. This is probably homesteads for fishermen families. Area with a really amazing agricultural scene. Hopefully, in the, the next few months. So we make reports that the wetland is really a public good. And it's lots of people of, of South Sudan, uh, and really all the people of the Nile Basin, part of a larger Nile Basin initiative. It's a world treasure that's to be protected from uh, private. Need. It's being threatened by uh, all courts. All sorts of things, including a actually drain much of the wetland, and uh, uh, the oil there. There's oil exploration that's uh, causing illegal logging. So it's a case study of uh, how do you markets, how do you use economics without glorifying markets. The real question is, uh, you know, what kind of a future do the people of South Sudan want? What do they want their country? to be like in 2050. <clears throat> so the question is, is really what it look like to the people of Sudan, the people living there in 2050, for example. Not much as it were was now to have a good world in 2050. That last question is really within the frame of, of you know, standard economic theory was discounting, uh, discounting the future and uh, decisions at the margin and so on. So this is the program we came up with. Again, you make the government, some government entity makes a decision uh, to preserve the for the public good uh, based on the science, how the marsh works, the hydrology, the biology, the economics of the people living there and potential uses. Then in that, you allow lo local initiatives to, to, to sort of 
welcome uh, the bottom up. Ecotourism, sustainable forestry, sustainable fisheries. I mean, all these and other uses uh, are compatible with this, again, ultimate goal of preserving the marsh. So we'll wrap this up. Uh, we behavior in government, uh, governance at sort of different levels. The end level is certainly important, you know, changing incentives, uh, how do people sort of like people to make the right decisions? So on. Uh, sort of a social aspect of behavior that people are beginning to look at now. So, um, individuals make decisions as members of social groups. And a interesting stuff done on, on uh, what position of groups make the best decisions. Uh, which ones, for example, I think of groups of five or six, they gave a hundred of these groups of and the characteristics of the group that uh, were most efficient in solving problems. And basically, to most of us, you needed a, a gender balance, you know, not dominated by males or females. Uh, you need a good communicate procedures for good communication, uh, and so on. So, uh, anyway, it's interesting research being done on that. And uh, the technology is really improving, too. When I was doing this stuff, uh, you know, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, most of the research was done on individual in MRI scanners. And I don't know if you've ever been in one of these things, but you know, it's not pleasant. The thing bangs, it's noisy. Now it's less intrusive ways to measure brain activity. Just a little sort of up on your head. You can also groups of five or six people interacting, and you can look at how parts of them slide up, how brain waves differ uh, if, if you're a member of the group and listening to other members of the group and so on. So again, the technology is revolutionizing behavioral economics and also something called neuroeconomics. And really, um, the global economy, relatively little work has been done on sort of the behavior of societies. Um, how the economic base drives social attitudes, what are the different conflicting uh, interest groups, um, how, is, how is power uh, gained and, um, and arranged in the whole-scale society, large-scale society. And again, interesting stuff being published. Most of you know the book by Thomas Piketty, uh, Capital in 21st Century. He talked about these long one run, uh, even centuries long trends. There's a really good book that just came out that I'm in the middle of by, uh, uh, it's called, and it's about uh, sort of the growth of inequality uh, through, throughout history. Levelers being, and it's based on thesis, his name is Walter Scheidel. His thesis is there's now natural tendency for inequality that's usually only broken by catastrophic events, so wars, plagues, uh, revolutions, and so on. Anyway, lots of interesting stuff are coming out there. Uh, okay. Questions yeah, and my email address. Uh, be free to contact me. Slide while we're letting everyone think, um, and just we know that our next uh, USSEE webinar uh, is scheduled for Wednesday, April 18th at 1 p.m. So we need to for that one. And now we a discussion on the ecological economics of climate change by Jim Kahn. Uh, this webinar is geared towards anyone from undergrads, working professionals. It's just sort of an overview of ecological economists uh, look at climate Would you review the relationship between the ultimatum aim and climate change? Uh, I think you know, two things. One thing is the importance of, uh, of different cultures in understanding how people make economic decisions. 
Uh, let me just give kind of a, a couple of examples. Uh, one culture study uh, was a culture uh, in New Guinea, the, sort of the head of a very simple agriculture. But these societies, I think it was called the uh, AU, um, UA. <clears throat> but these cultures are called big man cultures. And uh, so the way you get status there is to make a big show of giving things away. I mean, well, there's measured in the number of pigs you have. So establish your, your rank by giving giving someone having a big feast or giving one in pigs. So in the offers there in the ultimatum game were like 60, 70, 80 percent, and these were usually rejected. And the reason for that, you know, suppose I'm a big man, I give you three pigs, and you reject that because it's my way of saying, okay, I'm asserting my dominance over you, and you're letting me do it. Uh, there was another culture, uh, uh, it's a white culture called La Mer. I think it was also off the coast of New Guinea. Uh, they divided um, everything equally. Almost everyone gave half, some gave more. This society depends on um, fishermen hunting uh, these whales. And uh, again, it's sort of economic based. I mean, if, if a group of men catch a whale, I mean, you know, they can't eat the whole thing. So they share it, uh, and they're very elaborate reels about how to share them. Uh, uh, the, the catch and so on. Hodge, Tanzania, this is one of the last remaining hunter gatherer cultures, but that's very in Tanzania. And they gave very low offers, and the law offers were usually rejected, which is basically because hunter gatherers are noted for being really volunteering. But the reason for that, again, they hunted at small game, and it was just small groups of women, small groups of men, or men alone <coughs> catching small game. Um, they, you know, they have a habit too, arguing over everything and complaining. One of the anthropologists there called them the Kvetches of, of the Serengeti. Anyway, uh, so the point is, yeah, I think in, in terms of uh, policies about climate change, uh, how, do you, how do you get countries with very different values? And even countries like Germany, England, uh, the United States that are pretty close culturally have very different uh, attitudes about uh, sociology and so on, so social natures. Uh, uh, a person at um, NYU, Jennifer Jacquet, uh, has done a work on uh, playing these kinds of games, uh, simulating uh, games with world leaders and representing different countries about optimally designed policies about climate change by using game theory. So, uh, and so that's, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there uh, being done. Two more questions. The first is from uh, Mad Bat, and he says, could you elaborate a bit on different forms of social groups as they affect resource-based behavior? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, um, I think this, is, this question sort of opens up to about, to about current politics and uh, polarization and all that. But I think, I think the key is, <coughs> and I've been watching this debate about um, a, a gun which is pretty interesting. And uh, there's a, a group of people, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, so but he's sort of finance getting groups together, you know, people who want to ban all guns and gun owners who think, uh, you know, any any man, any restriction that is all uh, my second amendment. But surprisingly, if you get groups together in small face-to-face uh, -face groups, they can come to agreement. Uh, you know, things like, you know, not sell assault weapons to uh, people, uh, you know, committed serious crime, violent crimes, and mentally uh, ill, and so on. So, um, I, you know, again, the problem is how to scale that up, and I don't know if it can be done or not, but uh, I think a lot of the stuff from behavior economics, and especially uh, neuroeconomics, is really important. I did about neuroeconomics. Probably the leader there is a guy named Colin Hammer at Caltech, but he sort of, he looked at kind of um, sort of economic questions in uh, in very sort of innovative and unique ways. And he said, for example, rather than, than maximizing utility, uh, the question is something called homeostasis. I mean, people make decisions; they keep a mental state in balance, so their you know their minds and so on. He used that. Uh, I'm getting a bit off track, but he used that. Up to uh, look at how people make decisions about discounting. Parents about money. Uh, 
be really selfish and sort of present it and so on. If you think the question in terms of, you know, things like climate change and saving biodiversity, a different part of your brain actually lights up. And people make decisions they're willing to make sacrifices based on sort of long interest rather than short term interest. Your next question from Laura from John. How would you recommend pushing the ideological shift of large environmental features to be public? Uh, I think really, I mean, first of all, sort of, uh, I mean, just really look at that lecture by Mario Mazzucato about the realm of government. I mean, she makes so much sense. And, uh, you know, she has debates with these uh, sort of free market options and just always them, actually. I mean, it's kind of frank, I never have to debate it. But um, it's it really, it should be just common sense. I mean, you want to protect something like the Sioux and wetlands. It's not just, uh, you know, sort of tipping away how much of this part should we use, how much of that part, you know, 10 50 percent, 20 percent. I mean, you serve the whole same uh, thing in an intact way. Uh, so uh, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of what, what to do. I mean, some retired college professor, I can write papers and write reports, and I don't know how much of an impact uh, I can have. Uh, what I've been doing is trying to influence uh, local politicians. Uh, there's actually I went to uh, um, a thing two days ago, two nights ago, with one of the, the candidates for the, in the Democratic primary in this little town I live in. And uh, he was, I don't know if he'll win or not, I think he probably has a good chance. Dennis Ferris, I mentioned that idea, so there's a role of government and all that. And I'm asking why don't politicians are making an argument against government versus the market and trying to say spending your money it's a question of what it's spent on. And sort of also a very ardent environmentalist. So he's it he's so he's very interested in talking to me about his groups. I don't know if should, uh, I have an answer to that but uh I was really flipping the flipping thing the whole public question uh, I think it's interesting because it, it really flipped from putting a price on nature uh, and how much are you willing to spend as an individual? Or how much are you willing to spend as a society? Just let me say one more thing. I'm kind of getting off the track with that. But, but if something is like an, an externality, uh, then in economic theory, you uh, you just add up how much people are willing to pay. How much am I willing to pay by myself? How much is Erin willing to pay uh, by herself? And, and so on. The question of the public good really is, how much are you willing to pay if you know everybody else is going to pay too? It makes it a little different. I mean, most people, I think, would pay a lot more. I mean, I don't know. What would give $1,000 to combat climate change? What difference is that going to make? Probably nothing. But if in a country it gets $1,000, and I was willing to, will you do that or not? And I'm going to say yes. So, Jonathan Harris, uh, any thoughts? on which courses and how to get this into a standard curriculum, or do we need to put courses to address the multidisciplinary approaches to climate change? It seems to be about team reaching 15 students in a seminar and getting some basic info to thousands of students in intro to climate change. That's a really interesting question. Uh, there's a, yeah, a lot of people, um, well, I think, first of all, I should have an interdisciplinary course with an economist, uh, climate change, person, uh, yeah, about just about the effects of climate change. We had a like that at RPI uh, uh, years ago, but other people retired. So. But yeah, a multidisciplinary perspective is really important. I think also, let me do sort of light criticism of, of economics. Uh, there's a paper in the um, of Economic Perspective a couple of years ago. Really, it was called The Superiority of Economics. It was kind of a tongue-in-cheek article by a couple of the country. But did an analysis of uh, social science disciplines, economics, anthropology, political science, sociology. Uh, they found that uh, the economic profession is really isolated compared to other disciplines. Presentations in the top journals, like American Economic Review, Journal of Political Economy. What image is from other top journals and other economic journals? And uh, it was overwhelmingly. Economics. Other disciplines like anthropology.
biology. Their citations in their papers were from uh, life, sociology, even biology, you know, a much higher percentage of non-anthropology journals. Uh, and on the board of directors of the, 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 uh, the Association for Economic, uh, for Anthropology is called, or represented, uh, had a much more variety of schools. Economics, it's really three or four departments that uh, control journals. Journalistic economy is run out of the University of Chicago. Quarterly economics, MIT, and so on. So uh, the field uh, needs to be uh, much broader. Get to that, there's this article in the New York Times about women in economics, and it's actually following and, uh, about uh, the attitudes of female economists versus male economists. For example, uh, the question I can't remember exactly, but do you think that the role of government should be uh, reduced? Male overwhelmingly, yes. Female overwhelmingly, no. So it's a uh, again, it's a Narrowing of the same perspective. One more question if anyone has anything final that they'd like to ask. And of course, we later. Um, yeah. yeah. One of the things you as a facility research collaborations and get people who are working on this that might be the person working on this university talking to other people with similar interests. And please be in touch, and good luck to all of you and whatever you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. And for everyone, make the, uh, we'll make this recording available on our website. We'll send all of you that were here today a link just as we get that all sorted out. So I want to apologize for the uh, hospital Wi-Fi system. It <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Real quick. <laughs> I hope you here for doing that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Sure. I want to make sure about the recording. I, I got it myself, and I hope that it did not. I think it interrupted the recording for a few minutes. I'll take a look. We can take a look through once you get it and see. Um, can you drop it on our Google Drive when you're able to get it? Yep. That's 53 minutes, and I think uh, we lost a few. Okay. Stop the recording now and...